Yeah, okay, bad news, guys, but all of you are probably going to have to do attestation at some point. Um, fortunately, we have a project called Trusty that Claudia and I are going to talk about a bit, which will hopefully help you with this. Uh, Claudia and I are from IBM Research, and Chris and Matish and Daniela. Uh, similarly, they couldn't be here, but uh, you get us. So we're going to attempt to cram all these things into this discussion, but please feel free to stop me or slow me down, ask questions, um, but let's make sure we get to Claudio's topics as well. Um, first, a little bit of a reintroduction to Trusty. Most of you probably already have heard about this project already because Samuel talked about it last year at KBM Forum. Andy talked about it the year before last, no, at, L at LPC. Um, but back in the day, it was known as KBS or Confidential Containers KBS, Cocoa KBS, something like that. Now we have this name Trusty. We haven't actually renamed anything here, um, but Trusty refers to the collection of a couple of different components of which the KBS is one. So Trusty is kind of your complete attestation thing. Um, this diagram hopefully lays it out. Uh, Trusty consists of the KBS, the key broker service. This is the relying party in the rat's parlance. It also has an attestation service. This is the verifier. Um, it also has an RVPS, which is the reference value provider service. This keeps track of your golden measurements. Um, it also has a client that allows you to provision this stuff. And then you can see we have the guest side of things as well. There's a couple different ways to use this from the guest in confidential containers. We have an attestation agent and a confidential data hub. Um, but you can also have a much simpler KBS client, which we provide you, that allows you to just get resources into attestations. Um, yeah. We have a whole bunch of platforms that were supported, I think eight at the moment, and hopefully more coming soon. Um, you can see there's an interesting mix between actual hardware platforms and some clouds that implement their hardware in a certain way, or that implement attestation flows in a certain way. Actually, those Azure ones are connected to this HCL thing that we talked about earlier. Um, one thing to note, I mentioned that this is sort of connected to confidential containers. It's been developed in that community, but this from day one was intended to be a generic attestation solution. So truly, I wanted to work with everything that everybody here is doing, and if you think that's not the case, you should let us know. One final thing is a stat from the project. We have a PR um, response time on average of a little more than five hours. Mm -hmm. um, same thing for issues. And uh, we merge a lot of PRs kind of quickly, too. Um, so we like contributions. Come and, and talk, and, and you will get responded to. I don't know how that compares to your whatever projects you're in, but I think it's uh, not, not a bad stat. So the last piece of the introduction is that this whole thing is based around the KBS protocol, and this is the protocol that we use to establish a secure connection between the guest and the KBS, and we're going to use the secure connection to provide resources. And you can't read the thing anyway, so I won't go into the details, but basically there's a request, a challenge, an attestation, and a response. This sounds suspiciously similar to what we actually saw in Usama's presentation earlier with the tested TLS. The one thing I want to mention here that's kind of interesting is that this protocol does not specify anything about time, right? So all we know is that we need to do this to get a resource, but we don't say we need to do this at boot or we need to do this then or, or, or later or anything like that. Um, and we'll come back to that a little bit because it has some interesting implications. Okay, that's the introduction uh, done. Now I want to talk about some of the stuff that we're actually doing um, at the moment in the community to make this thing um, better. So one thing uh, to mention, first of all, is that we have a, two policies. Um, in Trusty, and at first this might seem a little bit inconvenient. Uh, the policies are both OPA policies, uh, Open Policy Agent, so you use the Rego language to write these things. Um, why do we have two? One of them is for the attestation service and one of them is for the KBS. And in particular, we're trying to actually capture two different things here. Your policy for the attestation service, this is the verifier, remember, should really capture um, what, what, what do we care about in the TCB, right? So it can, should kind of map onto how you're booting the guest, to how you're measuring the TCB. Right? For instance, in confidential containers, we care about four things in the TCB, the init RD, the kernel, the kernel command line, and the firmware. Right? So if we write a, a, a policy over here for confidential containers, we're going to say, oh, okay, well, how do I, what, what values in the like, report, for instance, should I compare to which reference values coming from the RVPS? That captures your class of workload. Right? Now, if you have a different workload that's not confidential containers, it's just a VM or something, you would probably have a slightly different policy to say, oh, you know, I have a DM Verity hash that I care about or something like that, so I'm going to use, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, compare some other value from the report um, to uh, some reference value. Okay, cool. The other policy is in the KBS, and this is all about when you should release different resources. So this is more about capturing your workload itself to say, okay, these secrets I care about, these secrets are associated with these ones, these ones should be released under this context or something like that. So we want to keep these things um, kind of separate. That's why we have two. Here's one of the things we're working on right now is replacing the token that goes between the two. So the output of the uh, attestation service policy is our attestation token, and that is the input 
part of the input to the policy um, in the KBX, right? At the moment, we have kind of a random token that just had some values we threw into it that seemed good, um, but we want to move to using the eat um, slash ear tokens. Um, and you might be familiar with this, there's a draft in this IETF phase to make a generic attestation token. And yeah, we wanna adopt that. Um, so we're in the process of doing this at the moment. And there's a couple of interesting things that have come up. One of them is that uh, this process is not really going to give us full interoperability. Um, in theory, if every verifier out there uh, gave you an ear token, you could then use these verifiers anywhere, right? And you could use them with any KBS. Uh, but the details are a little bit more complicated than that because there are some things in these tokens that are specific to the platform that you're in. For instance, uh, these tokens have a set of appraisals, right? So they can have like a CPU appraisal, which is a vector, by the way. This is the thing that's kind of the, the cool feature of this, is that this, this token has a vector in it that can tell you like, oh, here's the score. So it's not a binary like, oh, I passed or I failed. Uh, the attestation, it's a score for a bunch of different aspects of your TCB, right? And it's uh, hardware agnostic, but it's pretty specific. Um, anyway, so you have a vector of those vectors, and you need to key into this uh, with a name of the submodule, and it might be something like CPU, or it might be something else. So actually, your policy does need to know a little bit about who is generating the thing. So it's not quite as generic as we'd like, and that's maybe something, if anybody is, any of the IETF people are out there, um, that's something to maybe discuss. But it is gonna give us some nice parameters because it will allow us to uh, separate even more these two different types of policies, right? Because currently, um, if you, um, well, forget about what's going on currently, let's try and save some time. Basically, it will allow you to have a very um, specific but platform agnostic, generic information being conveyed from the attestation service to the KBS, then you can write some policies about that. So anyway, to actually implement this, we are going to need to make it so that we can generate one of these tokens from Rego in the attestation service policy, and we're most likely gonna do this by having uh, expected uh, outcomes, like expected uh, terms that you can generate inside of your policy, and those will automatically be populated into the vector that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this will involve replacing pretty much every single one of our policies that we have and all the default values, but that'll eh, be okay. So anyway, this is a big effort that's going on right now. Let me briefly tell you about two other things um, that we're working on some. First of all, runtime attestation. Okay. We do not consume runtime measurements, really, um, with Trusty, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how there's nothing about timing in the KBS um, protocol, right? That kind of entails that we need measurements that are not gonna change over the course of the guess because we tend to carry out this thing lazily, right? We do not do this policy, we do not do this protocol when you boot, we do it uh, like when you first want a secret, right? This will also uh, be kind of interesting when it comes to device support. Right, because most of the talk about device support, like what Samuel was mentioning earlier, is about doing something at bind time. Hmm, well, we don't really do that. We carry out our attestation later on, whenever, at whenever time. Um, so we most likely are gonna do some kind of re-authentication kind of thing. You still will need to do a, like a bind time thing with a TDM or something like that, but then we will probably re-attest. We probably wanna do this again so that we can give new nonsense to the devices and make sure the evidence is fresh, make sure that it's really connected to um, this challenge that came from the KBS, right? So we'll probably do it a second time. In general, I think it'll be relatively easy to generalize our current um, model where we basically have one CPU attester. We have a heuristic that detects, hey, you're on this platform, and it then triggers the attester for that. That will later automatically trigger the verifier in the attestation service for that. It should be relatively easy to generalize this to being, oh, I detected that I have this CPU and also this device and also this device and also this device, run the attesters for all of them, bundle up all of the evidence, give it to the attestation service, that will run all the verifiers, that will get the claims, and like I said, we have a vector of vectors in the EAT token, so we will then be able to generate uh, a vector for the trustworthiness of the CPU and all the devices, and then finally, your KBS policy will be able to say, okay, well these secrets should only be released if I have a GPU or something like that. Okay, I think that's um, most of my part. Any questions on any of this front? If not, we can go to Cloudy yeah. Strong. So I think one more slide back. Uh, so when you're talking, so you're say, you're having stated something that like the measurement is expected to be the same. So what about all these things where the TCB actually like changes because of you know COCOV and preserving updates and things like that? How yep. do you treat this case? Yeah. So your question is okay. Fine. If you depend on runtime measurement, what if the, the TCB actually changes? Um, yeah. We don't really count for that. So. But what's your view on this? Do you plan to support this? Well, yeah, we don't really, 
have a plan to support runtime measurements. I think our view on this is that your guest VM should be designed in a way that the TCP is not going to change drastically between requesting the secret and doing something else, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is not as controversial a statement as it might seem. But basically you're saying that like, it's up to VM to handle. Um, yeah, well, by the, at the time that you, you should boot the guest into a state that you are basically happy with for the duration of your workload. I have the same question, but slightly different. Like, so focusing on the device side, when do you imagine you should get like the secret for the root file system in the boot up process? Would you like to see all of the attached confidential devices attested before that, or are you comfortable after? And does after, I don't know, how do you feel about this? Yeah, well, so this ultimately is gonna be a policy question that you would define in your policy, and like Trusty itself is not gonna be too opinionated about that. When you go to request your like, root key for, some, for your uh, like disk or whatever, you'll go to get that secret, that resource will have to go through some resource policy, and that policy will be able to say, oh, only you know, give them this key if you have these devices or if you don't. Also, one other thing to your point, Elena, is that it is possible to do a, like, uh, to, to use runtime attestation on top of this, right? So you can, like people have talked about the, having the VTP in the paravisor. So Trusty is a good fit for injecting the initial state. Right, and then maybe if you have some type of guest that is gonna be really dynamic that you do wanna measure a whole lot, you can then use that. Uh, but you don't plan to no, well, so we don't plan to consume that evidence, um, but I think we are, it, trusty it could be very good for bootstrapping um, like a VTPM inside of a guest. Okay, I, we should uh, go to Claudio. So I had a quick, quick question about this. So before, before we proceed, so you mentioned about the um, trusty attestation protocol. Um, and I would argue that it's not an attested TLS because it's not happening at the TLS layer. It's happening way above that, which is the, uh, even above the HTTPS, right? So it's over HTTPS. And what stops, um, or what was the design so I was, I was uh, 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 like, honestly speaking, I was very excited. And in the CCC attestation SIG, we had a project that, okay, we will formally verify this uh, trusty attestation protocol. But then we came up with the problem when we analyzed it more deeply, we saw that, okay, so it has really no connection with the TLS. So it's not attested TLS, although it's a secure, um, attested secure channel, but I am really interested in knowing what design options actually led to not using attested TLS. When I say attested TLS, it should have some connection, either pre, inter, or post. So it really does not have that because it's happening way above that, which is the over HTTPS layer. So can you explain a little bit more about the design option? Yes. Why I'll you... do this as yes, I'll quickly. So look, the KBS protocol is designed to work over an untrusted interface, including something like the proxy we talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. We, I mentioned that it looks kind of like the intra handshake, attested TLS, that's kind of our goal. You can also use the protocol over TLS, but it is very difficult to get the correct expected certificate into the guest to verify the KBS. At least it's very difficult to make sure that you have the right one. Um, so yeah, it's designed to be over an untrusted channel, and we think that that is a feature. But honestly, I think we would maybe be open to transition the KBS protocol to happen over attested TLS. That's maybe something we should talk about. Not really over, so, so I would say within that TLS or, or at least some connection to the TLS, pre intra post, some, some, some connection to the TLS should be there so that provides you more guarantees like then authentication plus attestation. So I, I think I, I really have a feeling yeah, that it's very weak. We, you yeah. can use the KBS protocol over TLS. I'm actually quite skeptical about what you gain from that in most cases for reasons that are kind of subtle. Um, so you can use it over that or not. Yeah, let's get to the- Okay, yeah, yeah, happy to discuss good. after. So Tobin was talking in 1.5x. I have to talk on 2.5x. <laughs> so uh, basically, the idea is um, we are trying to provide some secure networking services uh, in software. Uh, and this is the VR that we've been discussing. Uh, the idea is that, well, each confidential virtual machine, it has its own protections, the TE, the TE protections. And when, when you send data over, sensitive data over the, over the wire, uh, you also need to protect that data and send it only to a trusted node. So basically that's the idea, how to do that. Uh, we, we kind of drive in some, giving some directions here, which is we try to protect that having a trusted, I, I, I put encrypted, but actually it's trusted overlay network. 
where we can create a, a trusted over the network. For example, if the node five is not trusted, we don't trust it. Although we can do a, a completely different thing, but we don't trust it. We, in your uh, over the network, it's not going to be part of this, your over the network. And if there is a, for example, a link that we don't trust and it's encrypt, unencrypted, the over the network will have this encrypted code. Uh, and there are multiple. Sorry. Uh, there are multiple uh, uh, frameworks or tools that you can use to, to encrypt. Uh, and Nebula, Nebula is one of them. Uh, there is also the IPsec options. Uh, the IPsec doesn't have the features we, we've been discussing. And Nebula has one interesting thing. Uh, it has a lighthouse, uh, and that lighthouse can control all the nodes that is part of your or overlay network. And the idea, and it, it has uh, support for, it's, it happens in layer three, and has support some to uh, the, the, some of the protocols uh, that uh, are most, most interested on. Um, and the idea is for Nebula is, well, it, Nebula doesn't support computational virtual machines, so we, we need to figure out a way to integrate it. So the whole industry is moving towards zero trust, right? Which pushes right. all of these things way higher up the stack, so you don't just randomly have a network that could potentially leak data somewhere where you don't want to have it leaked. What makes you think it's a good idea to enable a layer three network in such a setup? I'm sorry, link what? A. I would expect that confidential communication, which is what you're enabling uh -huh. here, right? Like confidential VMs that then communicate between each other and may need to exchange handshakes that say, yes, this is actually the right uh, entity on the other side, that they would want to strengthen their security posture. And mm -hmm. my understanding from the overall security community so far was that the higher up the stack you put that validation, the more secure it's considered, which is why we are in this world with zero trust. You put everything over the internet. You believe that everybody in, in between could intercept you, and so you don't even do things like secure networks. You just always do it on the application layer. But here you're enabling a networking stack to basically hide that fact from your application layer, right? Yeah, sort of. But there is also this part of uh, here with Nebula, we have, there is this lighthouse. So you already know that the node you're talking to is trusted. It was attested. And also, it, there is also some other th stuff, such as some other things, such as uh, DNS. If you need to talk to someone, and you could kind of benefit from this kind of lighthouses entity that is uh, coordinating, all, uh, maintaining all this information for you, and it could have, and you could have a hierarchical DNS and things like that. Sure, and then one of your nodes happens to have a curl backend thing that just happens to give you random access into some local IP address range by accident and you, you hold that work is toast. While if you do it all on higher level application layers, you're, you're, you're naturally protected against that. So we usually try to design our networks these days by not have enabling either way. Keep going. <laughs> one, one unmodified application. You, you want authentication at the application layer to be trivial, right? You want to... Now just keep in mind, this is mainly happening for confidential containers. So we want to be able, someone has a, a totally normal workload, they don't change it at all, but now they're going over this encrypted network. So we want completely unmodified applications. <laughs> he keeps showing me the stop sign. Um, oh. I, I understand I'm not a huge fan of the notion that you can lift and shift something into confidentiality that wasn't confidential before. It's not gonna work. Uh, let me ask just one qu quick question. Can I? <laughs> Hopefully. So uh, it's about, uh, I'd like to see if you guys have any feedback on, on um, offloading uh, encryption to the NIC. Um, we have this, all these problems with, um, okay, uh, the NIC can support attestation, but then is the NIC ready to, uh, can we, uh, is it okay if we uh, offload the, the encryption to the NIC? Does the NIC uh, has all these separations, uh, these isolations, and so on? Yeah, it does? I get, okay. So, since I, so since I have the okay microphone. So it's okay to offload <laughs> encryption, okay. Since I have the microphone, I can give you a very simple, very simple answer to that question. <laughs> if you run a confidential 
VMs with CephSMP and the likes, and you want to rely on, on that infrastructure. The whole purpose is to remove the cloud vendor from the equation. All cloud vendors these days use DPUs, which means they own the software stack, at least for us, that's completely the case. Some others do too, which means they cannot, by definition, be part of a TCB. Okay. 